Um, yes, I will. So now it, it will become a, a little bit more theoretical again. Uh, hopefully I can then bring, bring that together with implementation. Uh, I will talk about um, a systematic review and expert consensus we, we have done uh, together with Imperial, um, Geneva, Imperial, and uh, University of Freiburg as a work which was initiated by the CDC a couple of years ago, which uh, was called the Hospital Organization Management and Structure for Prevention of Healthcare-Associated Infection. It was, uh, there were two work packages. Uh, we started with a systematic review, and then we had the experts discussion, consensus, evaluation of the systematic review, and then the phrasing of uh, the key components or the strategies, as you will see later on, and allocating some indicators. When we start with the systematic review, just briefly, behind this was uh, the, the work of uh, Mark Strulens, uh, who works with CCDC. The idea was initially to have five dimensions. A dimension about organization and structure of infection prevention and control. The second was everything about surveillance and feedback. The third about education and training. Then everything about multimodal strategies, but basically everything in the context of behavioral change. And policies, resources, isolation precautions, more or less a pot with the rest of, of strategies. The idea behind this was that after a systematic review to define the core or key aspects, elements that are important for any of those dimensions and to come up with one or two or three, but certainly not a large number of key components linked to those dimensions. So what we did, we did five systematic reviews uh, among the three sites and uh, came up first with a number of elements which then uh, were discussed with um, the experts. For the systematic reviews, we applied uh, a large systematic review. All quantitative uh, uh, methodologies were uh, eligible to be, to be assessed, quality assessed, but also qualitative research and mixed methods approaches. We looked in Medline, Cochrane, control trials registers, uh, any, any large database where we would expect to find, um, um, to, to find uh, articles or studies uh, for those key component systematic review. The outcomes we were interested in were either having an effect on healthcare associated infections or improving hand hygiene compliance or reducing the transmission of multidrug resistant organisms. Once we identified articles by titles and abstracts, we went to the full text as is usual in the systematic review and we had to quality assess them. We did not use the grade approach, but we used uh, a new tool, tool which was at that time uh, uh, established by a colleague from Imperial College and we integrated this also for this systematic review, which is called the Integrated Quality Criteria for Reviews of Multiple Study Designs, ICROMS, which basically is a list of what items, you, you don't have to read, have to read that, so, so you can read the paper if you're interested, but, but anyway, so it is just a list of, uh, of elements which need to be met for, for each of the different types of studies and whether they, it, it's mandatory or not mandatory, and there is a score behind that, and then you see uh, you, you have to, you, a, a study needed to have a certain threshold and minimum criteria to make it to the final evidence base. Then we had an expert group, and the expert group which was quite um, large in the sense of knowledge. There weren't too many people, about 20, and they had different backgrounds, infection control, infectious diseases, microbiology, so this is the obvious, but you also had nurses. Uh, we had uh, representatives of uh, repre uh, representation from social sciences, health policy, public services management, and psychology. When we did the systematic review, of course, breaking down in five dimensions, we had a total of 50,000 titles and abstracts and narrowed that down, 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 down until we had 92 eligible publications uh, on which the key components or the definitions of the key components were based on. 
So once we had the first set of elements, we invited the, um, the, the experts and they had to comment on those. They had to comment uh, whether we did a good job with the systematic review or we left something out. And indeed, the, astonishingly, although we used a very bro broad um, uh, search term, uh, we did not find papers on auditing, on target setting, on patient participation and knowledge management, at least not with sufficient quality. So we went back, we adjusted the, the, the search terms again just to look specifically for those, uh, for those questions. And we found then by this second round papers on auditing, but not on patient participation, we found, but not of sufficient quality. There was nothing on target setting. I mean, this is, we realized later, it's not something you would find in the peer reviewed uh, literature, but you find maybe on national levels where there are national targets, for instance, it's not that they are not out, <clears throat> not out there. And uh, knowledge management, there was, uh, there, were, there was nothing, basically. But this is also something that you, you could find in other types of literatures. So finally, we, we had um, the, final set, the final set of key components and uh, indicators were alloc allocated. We asked the experts to comment on ease of implementation. So for each key component, is it difficult to implement on a uh, hospital setting, is it complicated or difficult to implement and cross-country applicability since this was a ECDC driven uh, project they were interested if, if this can be recommended across Europe or this is something we only can recommend for high income countries versus well there are no uh, low, middle in, uh, low middle income countries in Europe but there is definitely a shift or a gap between Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Those are the 10 key components. I will go through them uh, one, one by one. Um, there, there were 10 key components or 10 key, uh, key strategies, which then indicators actually were used later uh, in the ECDC point prevalence survey. So there, was, there, were, there were meetings where we would discuss the key components and discuss the allocate or attached indicators and decide with uh, country representatives which of the indicators should be uh, go into the ECDC point prevalence survey and be asked. So on which of the indicators we would like to gather information in Europe. Interestingly as well is that after we did that job, um, um, two years later, WHO wanted to re- <laughs> phrase redefine their core components and based on the work we did before before ECDC WHO decided to do exactly the same so we provided them with the search terms we participated also in the systematic review this time for WHO um, it was uh, they applied the, the exact same uh, strategy with some exceptions because for quality assessment they used uh, grade and they were not allowed to have uh, uh, qualitative and mixed methods uh, uh, studies in that systematic review uh, because WHO at that time had the policy that everything must be evidence-based and if, if there is no evidence base, so to speak, uh, behind that, uh, we cannot really recommend it. It does not mean that qualitative research is not evidence-based. It is just that it uses a different methodology for quality assessment, which is different from the methodologies you use for quantitative uh, uh, studies. So this is a little bit sad, and you will see, uh, as a consequence, uh, they have eight core components versus ten key components. Basically, just due to the fact that two of the key components are based entirely on the results of qualitative research. So one by one, organization of infection, and, uh, infection control. Here we have to say there is only one study ever done to test having infection prevention and control versus not having infection prevention and control. This was the CENIC study performed in the 70s and published 1985. Um, and uh, so basically, by sticking to the evidence, we 
only could use the numbers which were defined 40 years ago or published 40 years ago. However, in the paper, when you read it, you will clearly see that, of course, I mean, we, we discussed this and say, for instance, this famous one nurse is for 250 beds, that today the opinion is that actually you should have a relation which is much more favorable than one to 250 beds. But basically, yes, you need infection prevention and control. So on the left-hand side, you have, uh, you have the key component, ECDC key component. On the right-hand side is always the WHO core component and the phrasing. I mean, the phrasing is, is sometimes different, but basically it's the same. Ward occupancy and workload. This is the results of different elements. We just grouped different ele the, the, the element of workload, of staffing, and um, on oc occupancy together, because uh, basically they follow the same rationale. So now it, it is, it is a, a key strategy saying that you should be careful uh, not to have over-occupied your wards, not exceeding the capacity for which it was built, because officially when you build a ward, you intended to, to build this ward for a certain capacity. So you should not have patients, for instance, uh, in, in the hallways. Um, you should make sure that this famous, you should have this famous 80% at midnight. This famous 80% occupancy at midnight has nothing to do with infection prevention and control, but it, is, it has been defined as the optimal occupancy in a hospital still to make profit, but giving the hospital also managerial flexibility in case of patient influx and efflux. Not only in outbreak situations or accident situations, but also in surgery, for instance, where it's normal that you will have patients entering the hospital while you still have the patients not having uh, been dismissed already. Then, um, then the workload, staffing and workload of frontline staff, we phrased it, must be adapted to the acuity of care. So it must be adapted to care. So something that we do not do any, anymore today. When I did my training uh, years and years ago in the Children's Hospital of Zurich, intensive care, it was normal that if there were not sufficient nurses in the ward, they would close beds. And there was no question about it. You could not, that was non-negotiable because it was considered we need to have a certain amount of nurses or a ratio to provide care to the standard we want, we want, we want to provide. Something that is today, I think we, we have totally let go of this, this philosophy. Materials, equipment and ergonomics. Um, there is a lot of information coming from the hand hygiene papers saying that you need to have the hand drop where you really use it. Um, this year was very, very interesting. Um, I, I, had the, uh, I had the opportunity to do, uh, to do a country visit with ECDC. I will do have another one next week. So I do not say in which country we were, but it was, it was, a, it was a country with a very high level uh, healthcare here in Europe and uh, very advanced. And then we went to, hosp to, to, to hospitals and looked in the wards, and were in the infectious diseases ward. And actually there were many hand drop dispensers, but none of them was placed in a manner, in a manner that you would really use it. You, you would have to lean over the patient to reach it, or it was at the entrance. It was, it was really weird. I mean, how uh, it's so simple, but it, what they really managed to put those dispensers to place, the many dispensers to places that probably they, they will never be used. Guidelines, education, and training. So this core component is not so much about uh, having or not having guidelines. We, we have many guidelines. We have basically too many guidelines. We literally are, are drowning in guidelines. But the problem is that we do not really use the guidelines appropriately. So basically, the message here is that use a guide. You, I mean, first of all, you need to have, every, every hospital needs to have a reference manual. And those reference manuals are guidelines. Either they are done in a hospital, or you take another one from the society or from, from, from a publication, and you endorse it and say, OK, this is what is valid in our hospital. But then, then you should really use those guidelines in your education and training. What you should at all costs avoid is that you teach something in your, in your IPC lessons which is not in line with your guideline you have in your hospital. 
Team and task-oriented education and training. Um, education and training involves frontline staff and is team and task-oriented. A little, little story to that. I had, when, I, when I had my first project, uh, at that time it was at the University Hospital of Zurich, a young fellow in, in, ten, in, in infection prevention and control. I was given the responsibility for a catheter infection prevention project. And uh, I did a literature su uh, survey. I had my ideas, what I wanted to do. And my idea is that, okay, we go now to the five intensive care units of the hospital and tell them what to do. And we measure baseline, we measure outcome, and, and that's it. And then we had, fortunately, uh, the senior nurse uh, there for since many years and told them, no, no, Walter, just, uh, stop it, stop it. We can, you, can, you cannot just waltz in the ICU and tell them what to do and then expect that it would literally do that. So what, what we did then, uh, we, lo we lost time, but it was well, well spent losing time. Um, it is, uh, we, we went to the, to the ICUs, we, invi we invited them to, uh, to, uh, to focus groups. Then we, we, uh, we presented them, okay, listen, guys, this is, this is what we had in mind. So tell us, is this feasible, is this not feasible? And anyway, would you also participate in, this, in, 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 the, in the education session? <coughs> and it was very, very nice. We had, we had always, we, had, we did three of those focus groups with different uh, stakeholders of the ICUs, uh, two hours each, and we had very good discussions. By the end of it, we adapted the protocol, I mean, really made, made changes. And we had the people from the ICUs in the boat. They also, for after that, they considered that project also their project. Similarly, in Geneva, when we did another project, we had the direction of nursing in the boat. And when we, this was a hospital-wide study, and when we wanted to train the nurses, we could not train the nurses at bedside or uh, in, in simulation workshops. Uh, so we had to come up with, uh, with an e-learning tool, with modules, and we had trained the trainer. So in, in that case, we invited nurses from the wards. Uh, we trained those nurses. We made them uh, use, uh, known how to use the e-learning tool, and then train their peers. And we went. We, we, what we did then is some audits just to make sure that they used the, the, the tool accordingly. However, the whole organization of this, we could not do. Basically, we are, I mean, the nurses were not the employees of IPC, so they were employees of, in, uh, of the nursing department, so we had to hand over everything to them. But this was good, because by the end of the day, the department of nursing were convinced that it was their idea and their problem, and uh, it was their project, and as a consequence, they did it really great. I mean, they organized everything. They, they, they trained uh, almost 1,000 nurses in three months using that modular e-learning system. This was really phenomenal. And we could never, we, 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 were, we, we had been never in the position to do that if not by collaboration with the Department of Nursing. Standardization of audits. Um, here I have to say that for the key components, we did not understand audits as a surveillance activity. Audits, what we found evidence in the literature as reducing infection is when audits are an active, mostly individual process where you go, somebody, somebody goes to look a process, to watch a process, and give immediate feedback to a healthcare worker. And, if, and for, the, for, for this activity, we have seen that it can have a positive impact on infection. And if you use that, it's helpful. It's, uh, it, it, this is why basically I mentioned this morning that for me, auditing is an intervention tool. It's not a surveillance tool because it helps you to interact with the healthcare worker and give immediate feedback and help learning. It's, it's sort of a learning by doing, learning in daily practice. I had, an, I had an interesting discussion just before coming here, which also goes a little bit to this direction. And if, if you can do that, I think it's a, good, it's a good method to do that. Surveillance, feedback, and networks, yes, it works. Probably you, it, it, you, you, you reduce infections already when you announce that you are going to do surveillance, in, even if you do not do surveillance. This is 
this, this is on a little bit unfortunate because I can tell you from my own experience, also in Prohibit, but in all the other uh, pro projects as well. When you start a project and do your power calculation, you have your assumptions about how are the rates of infections and how many patients do you have to involve. So you need to have half those rates of your basic assumption because what happened also in Prohibit is that hospitals gave us their estimates of, of infections, but once they started the project as a baseline, they already reduced their infections. It's just that, that's, that's just something that happens. This is behavioral change. People know basically what they have to do and to do it, and even outside an intervention. That does not mean that you should not do the intervention, but, but anyway, it is the, po the point is that, yes, surveillance, feedback, and especially if you do a good feedback, timely feedback, this lowers infections. Prevention by, mu prevention by multimodal strategies. Um, we have seen many papers. So when we started to do the systematic review, my personal fear was that we will find hundreds of intervention studies uh, using a bundle, using a bundle plus, using a device, using a device plus a bundle, using this and that and blah, blah, blah. And then you would have to comment on, oh, wow, should we use a, a catheter bundle? Should we use a web bundle? Should we use a, a, a Kaoti bundle? And which of the components of the bundle and the elements of the bundles should be recommended and which should we less recommend? And this would have been a nightmare to, to analyze, I can tell you. Fortunately for us is that there is, even if you have bundles, there is no single study that is alike. All the studies are different, especially when it comes to implementation process. Uh, and uh, this gave us, uh, well, this, this, let's say, uh, allowed us to, to come up with a more broader um, definition of it. And this is why we decided to frame this as a multimodal strategy. This is why you find this multimodal strategy. What it means that uh, go to the literature, yes, use bundles, uh, but if you have a bundle of five or a bundle of six or a bundle of ten, I do not go into detail what is a bundle. You can ask me, no, I will, I will leave. But anyway, so a bundle is an implementation concept, just that you know. But anyway, so if you use 10 elements or five elements or 20 elements, doesn't really matter. What really matters is how you are going to implement this and that you use what I uh, talked this morning, repetitive, breakdown, multimodal approach, Different, different, different means of how you, you, you deliver the message and how you involve healthcare workers. This is what it means. And, and this opens you the, a whole world of innovation. Be innovative, be, be, uh, do create, be creative in whatever, whatever you do. I, I don't think you can make many mistakes as long as you really try to, to address your peers on on, on, on their level, I mean, there are adults we are going to train, they are not children, and that you do not only address knowledge, but that you move into all the, the, all the, all the different aspects of, um, of interventions. Then the two last, role and engagement of champions. Um, well, first of all, there were some, some convincing studies, qualitative studies about this anyway, so this is why we kept it. But um, to, to, to have it as a, as a separate, not integrating into organizational culture is because it has a particular important message for infection prevention and control. Since we are only few in the hospital, and we have to train many in the hospital, we need allies. And we need those champions in the units that, who, who help us to, to make our projects so successful. What is a champion? A champion is, is a person, a nurse or a doctor, who are motivated, intrinsically, naturally motivated. Those people, they really want to make a difference, they invest to work better, uh, just because who they are. So for us, the important is that we have to know those people and we have to address them and we have to integrate them in our projects. What you cannot do is appoint 
champions. And this is something I don't think this is it, you are, you are, it's a problem in France. But, but worldwide, sometimes I, I heard ma many, many uh, professors or respon uh, responsible say, oh yes, and then we appointed champions as part of the implementation strategy of the project, and this does not happen. This does not work, of course. And creating a positive organizational culture. So the positive organizational culture, of course, is work satisfaction, but it's also workflow, it's also how it is organized, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it has also to do with Slack resources. So it is not only whether we, you feel happy or unhappy in your organization. So there's, there's, there's a lot, there are many issues are attached to what is a, a positive organizational culture. But by the end of the day, it is a culture where healthcare workers feel safe, where healthcare workers, they, uh, they identify positively with the institution. So again, uh, those uh, key components and, uh, had, had an impact on the uh, uh, indicators which then were used uh, in the point prevalence survey. Uh, the first uh, paper should be published on November 15th. So, uh, and uh, there are some interesting, there are some interesting outcomes you will see in terms of, uh, of indicators. So now I uh, can move a little bit faster. Those uh, ten key components actually address different levels in a hospital. Uh, when we did when we did the systematic review on the whole the whole project, we were not much aware on on well first of first of all we were not aware, we did not know what we what we would find. It's just afterwards that, that I realized that uh, those key components, they fit quite well in the structure of an organization and the different levels of an organization, such as implementation, structure, and activities in infection prevention and control, management, and the organizational culture. Interestingly, those two uh, areas and the key components attached with them, they affect infection prevention and control. And I think here we can ask, okay, so if you, if you, if we, if we take those key components and say those are key components which affect our work, which means that we should, we are responsible that those key components are implemented in the hospital, what competencies do we need? Um, and I was invited to do a, a short review uh, a couple of years ago for UKIC. And I came up a couple of publications, and I just want to focus on the trice areas and the APIC domains. The trice areas you just heard from from uh, from uh, Enrique, uh, those those components, uh, ECDC components, uh, they are summarized in in those four trice areas, and you can see it's not only knowledge of IPC. So we are not just there to give answers when healthcare workers come to us with a specific question of disinfectants or sterilization or free processing, but we are there. We, have, we need to have skills in management, leadership, and we also need to have skills in implementation. And I like that the Americans, uh, they even specified it in the APIC domains that uh, uh, here on, at the end, yeah, here performance, improvement, and implementation science. So they used exactly that term. So my view of an infection prevention and control specialist is this. The hospital, the IPC specialist, is in the middle of a hospital and does networking with all the different stakeholders. When you link this to APIC and TRICE domains, you can say that uh, organization of infection control it addresses program management, leadership, interaction with hospital management, IT, microbiology, ward occupancy and workload. It addresses leadership uh, because it's hospital management. It's leadership for you to make that, that, that running, but also leadership towards the hospital management because you have to interact them and convince them and the clinical departments that something needs to be done in the workflow and staffing, materials, equipment, ergonomics, uh, you network in addition to nurses and doctors because you cannot, you should not introduce a new device in your hospital without asking the opinion of healthcare workers before you're going to um, introduce this. Use of guidelines, 
Uh, you link with outside the hospital, IPC societies, or Ministry of Health. Team and task-oriented learning, of course, this addresses mainly nurses and doctors, but it sits actually in a broader context of collaboration with management, IT, if you do e-learning or, or, or other platforms, clinical departments, microbiology, for instance. Surveillance and feedback, also relatively broad. You need IT, you need hospital management, you need microbiology, but you also should network, benchmark with outside of the hospital, multimodal strategies. This is something you do basically in collaboration with uh, nurses and doctors, your, 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 your target group, together with clinical departments, champions. This is only between you and the healthcare workers. And positive organizational culture, of course, involves everybody. Um, so when it comes to implementation, implementation, um, we, can, we can map some of those key components, five of those key components specifically to implementation or having implementation consequences. So having new materials, introducing new devices, working on ergonomics, using guidelines, applying guidelines, how to do, to do education and training, how to apply multimodal strategies, and engaging of champions. Those are really focusing on or being linked to implementation. So when we map now the implementation, uh, the implementation strategies or, or um, uh, the, the five dimensions, the C for five, uh, five dimensions with 10 key components, we can, we can distribute them a little bit. So IPC uh, is, uh, is, is uh, uh, addresses to hospital. Also, of course, uh, has an impact on how much you can invest in implementation process, how you come up with your intervention. Then staffing workload bed occupancy <laughs> affects the, the, the people, the healthcare workers, the hospital, equipment ergonomics. Usually this is part of what you want to, to implement and it's part of the process in the sense that when you use a better equipment that simplifies your work, it is also part becomes then part of the process and is not only an implementation, uh, an intervention. Guidelines the same, basically. Education and training is part of a process and involves, of course, the whole hospital and people. Auditing is part of a process. Uh, surveillance, part of and feedback, part of a process and feedback to the healthcare workers. Multimodal strategy as part of a process, but heavily involving all different peers and stakeholders in the hospitals and champions, part of a process, but involves the, peop the people, the individuals of the hospital and the organizational culture. So with this, I would like to thank uh, the uh, site study team of the different uh, organizations, uh, ECDC, World uh, uh, Health Organization and the experts, and thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Walter. So, uh, being an ICP is a fascinating job, but a very difficult one, <laughs> indeed. So, some questions maybe about you know now what is the core component guidelines of who? They were depicted uh, precisely, Gabriel. Je vais faire en français parce que ça. C'est bon, oui, je peux répondre en français. C'est juste que je ne suis pas toujours très à l'aise avec la, le vocabulaire ou le travail que j'ai fait en anglais. Mais, oui. euh, il y avait une diapositive que je trouvais, enfin, la diapositive avec le docteur en plein milieu de l'hôpital. La IPC euh, en, en, au milieu de l'hôpital, je trouvais intéressante parce que géographiquement parlant, souvent les unités d'hygiène en France sont en dehors de l'hôpital. Même en dehors. C'est le cas ici à Nantes. Pour nous, enfin, on est dans un bâtiment qui n'est pas au sein des services cliniques. C'est un bâtiment de santé publique qui fait partie de l'hôpital, mais qui n'est pas au sein de la clinique. Et, et cette image me semblait importante. C'est qu'un enfin, un hygiéniste qui fait partie de l'hôpital doit être au cœur de l'hôpital. Enfin, je sais pas oui, quel est votre point. Euh, oui, moi, moi je pense aussi. Je, je, je crois que, évidemment, euh, par, par exemple, pour, pour donner un exemple de l'Allemagne, en Allemagne, ils ont ce, cette, euh, cette spécialité d'un hygiéniste. 
Un hygiéniste, c'est une, une formation qui est complètement à part de tous les autres cliniciens. Et malheureusement, ils sont perçus un peu comme des, 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 des médecins inférieurs. Parce qu'ils ont choisi ce métier parce qu'ils n'étaient pas capables pour devenir un vrai médecin. Et ça, ça c'est ça, ça, un problème parce qu'ils n'ont jamais perçu un égal. Et par exemple, en Suisse, c'est complètement différent parce que nous sommes tous des, 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 des spécialistes en maladies infectieuses. Et nous sommes perçus comme égales. Et ça, ça simplifie la communication, surtout vis-à-vis d'autres médecins. Et c'est vrai que c'est pourquoi ce matin, j'avais ce diapo où j'avais dit qu'il fa il fallait vraiment... Euh, comment on se dit, renforcer la position des hygiénistes, surtout des, des infirmiers et infirmières, parce que euh, parce qu'on est, parce qu'il faut communiquer avec les différents interlocuteurs à l'hôpital, on est obligé d'avoir un soutien pour avoir la posture, la position de vraiment dire quelque chose. Another question or comment Hervé Blanchard. Oui, bonjour Walter. Bonjour. Euh, on a eu la chance de se rencontrer déjà, ouais. au moins une fois, ouais. sur le terrain d'ailleurs, dans un hôpital. Euh, au fond, juste une question par rapport à l'audit euh, tel que vous l'avez présenté. Moi, je, ce que je pense, c'est qu'on doit faire des audits en étant les promoteurs. Est-ce que ce n'est pas important que ça soit mené plus comme ce qu'on appelle en France de l'évaluation de pratiques professionnelles par les gens qui travaillent au plus près des patients plutôt qu'un audit fait par l'équipe d'hygiène, comme souvent, malheureusement, on est amené à le faire en France Oui. Donc, bon, audit interne ou audit oui, externe oui, oui. Non, en principe, moi, je suis d'accord. Par exemple, je ne peux pas parler du fait que dans tous les projets, j'étais impliqué à Zurich, à Genève, en Europe, au niveau prohibite. Par exemple, nous n'avons jamais fait des, des, des interventions nous-mêmes en tant qu'hygiénistes. On avait toujours voté pour engager les, les collègues dans le terrain qui faisaient le, la formation à leurs collègues. Et ça, ça c'était toujours bien perçu. Ça, c'était une formation, mais aussi... Quand on fait un audit aussi, je pense que ça, ça, ça c'est ça c'est l'idéal. Si on a quelqu'un dans les unités qui est un champion, par exemple, qui est vraiment doué, qu'on peut qu'on peut utiliser pour former pratiquement euh, en, en appliquant un audit ses, ses collègues, à mon avis, ça, ça serait gagnant. Ouais. Si vous avez la possibilité de le faire, oui, je trouve c'est une bonne idée. Last question. Attends le micro, s'il te plaît. À un moment, vous avez dit qu'à l'hôpital de Zurich, quand il manquait du personnel, on fermait des lits. Est-ce que vous pourriez un peu préciser de cette chose-là Et ce serait intéressant de savoir dans la salle s'il y a des expériences identiques Bon, c c bon, ça c'était à, à l'hôpital universitaire des enfants à Zurich. Je ne je, je suis pas sûr que euh, chez les adultes, on avait la même, la même stratégie. Et ça, c'était dans les années 90. Mais, moi, franchement, moi, j'ai l'impression qu'aujourd'hui, ils ont, ils ont abandonné aussi cette pratique. Par ailleurs, là, je peux vous dire qu'à cette époque-là, il y avait quelque chose à cet hôpital aussi dans, 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 dans la culture. Cet hôpital s'est compris toujours d'être un hôpital de référence avec une réputation internationale et on voulait vraiment faire au meilleur. Même après, quand moi je travaillais en tant que pédiatre dans une unité des nourrissons, je n'ai jamais vu dans ma carrière, ni avant ni après, une équipe qui était tellement dédiée aux soins des enfants et, et prise en charge des familles qu'on pouvait vraiment adresser des choses que normalement autrement on n'aurait pas le temps pour, pour parler avec les, avec les parents pour, pour, pour adresser des choses sociales et, et, et beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup d'autres choses c'était pas seulement un professionnalisme mais juste une, une, une identification une, un comportement qui était hors norme ouais. mais c'est l'exception je pense 
So, on a plus de questions en français quand même. Hein. Thank you very much, Walter. And I think we have many ideas to, to move forward. <laughs>